First of all, thank you very much for in, uh, having me here. Uh, I always uh, like coming to Liverpool and it's particularly a uh, pleasure to present this project to you. Um, it's, it's very different from what's been presented by the other uh, people and I hope in this sense it won't appear next to your work um, uh, overly banal. I mean, it's a very, let's say, uh, a different work in a sense. But in any case, I, I want to start by, by saying a little bit about what the real foundation is, because I think this is also kind of quite key. Um, the real foundation is um, an architectural firm and a cultural institute that I founded just before winning the competition for the British Pavilion. Um, I called up uh, Ellis uh, Woodman, who's the director of the Architecture Foundation, and asked what their structure, what their corporate structure was, because I, I wanted to know basically how you could create uh, an architectural firm which operated in the same way as a cultural institute. And when we look at different names for firms and different structures for firms, of course, you know, we have office, atelier, studio, um, you, you'll see very you know, diverse uh, types of names being used. Um, there are not architectural firms on the whole which are uh, uh, foundations. Um, the main difference is that I'm the director of the foundation, I'm not a partner, my name isn't on the, above the door. So with the idea that um, I can leave the practice in the future and it will still be governed by the same uh, set of uh, criteria, we have a certain kind of mission statement which sets out the types of projects we can and can't do. Anyway, the idea is is very much to to work across m many different types of culture um, and to not draw a distinction between a drawing, a publication, an article, a book, an exhibition, and a building. And we are working up, I mean, our, our main interest and our ultimate aim is just to produce ha housing. That's really all we're, we're interested in. But in a way not to create a hierarchy and just say, well, it's only you know, the finished building which is the most perfect expression of the idea. All the other uh, forms are, are integral to that. So it stands for the Real Estate Architecture Laboratory Foundation. Anyway, uh, Home Economics was the name of the British Pavilion. Um, it was a very kind of strange process. I mean, to say something about the Biennale itself, which I think I have maybe, uh, yeah. Well, we'll start there. The Biennale is a really weird entity, and I think the question of what the Biennale is for is a very good one. I was profoundly suspicious and skeptical of Aravena's uh, proposal or proposition, because I, I think as what, what we've seen today is that um, I don't think you can have humanitarian architects. I don't think, I mean, I think you can be a socially engaged citizen and a uh, you know, a, a socially minded individual or part of a group, I, I don't know to what extent that really is in, intrinsically present in architecture as a practice itself. Anyway, the, the idea was that that was how we were going to do it. And let me go back. Of course, I didn't think I would win this exhibition. I'd only graduated the year before. So it's, you know, a really kind of strange. I was not prepared for it, basically. And then had to deliver this thing, which, which was tricky. But the idea was basically to propose new models for domestic life and, and up until now most exhibitions that look at housing, look at typology, look at uh, demographics, look at socioeconomic status. What I was really interested in was the category of time and uh, ha what happens when you say, you know, um, how is what it means to be at home for days intrinsically different from what it means to be at home for years? How does that uh, dimension of how long you spend in a certain place influence its design because then you're really trying to attain a kind of universal condition which hopefully is relevant for, for Britain but also in an international context. Um, the uh, main kind of difference in terms of divining, d designing through space and designing through time is that when you design through uh, space, so you've got a kind of typical plan on the left here, you put in all the functions and you articulate them uh, spatially. So you say, okay, this is how much space it takes to do the washing up. That's the activity. We'll draw a line around it. We'll pop it in there. In this plan on the left, uh, someone is presumably having a sleep, riding the elevator, having a meal, taking a shit. They're all basically happening simultaneously. And the reality is that's not how we use space. Um, and that's not how we exist through, through time. The project on the right, which is done by a uh, young um, Scandinavian and uh, but, or with an, a London office uh, architecture firm called Hesselbrand, who were part of the exhibition. They were the exhibition architects for this 
uh, pavilion. Um, this is a project they designed a few years ago in which they were not, uh, they were looking at basically functionlessness. Uh, how you design a space that has no specific function. Because if you're designing for, say, many decades, um, you have to assume that you know, society will change through time. And the problem with the image on the left is that by designing a space which perfectly matches the function, you make it impossible to change that function. I mean, if you think of the way kitchens are designed, the kitchen I live in was made in the 1970s, and it's a galley kitchen. Um, it's designed to optimize one woman at home during the day making a meal. Uh, the problem is that if I have Italian friends round, that doesn't work. I mean, the space is completely wrong for having multiple people in the room at once. And so that, that uh, social relation, that power relation, that gender relation in the kitchen is crystallized into the space and makes it impossible to change in the future. And so by designing through time, the idea was to explore the idea of spaces which are non-functional with a view to giving the people who live there the possibility to uh, reinvent their relationships to each other in space. This is the kind of traditional Biennale uh, you know, interior, which is, uh, you can either, as I said before, you can either do an exhibition of architecture, which relies, in my opinion, on the history of kind of the way that art is presented, um, the way in which objects are, are contextualized through the, the gallery system, let's say, or you can really do what I would consider like architectural exhibitions, which is, uh, a way of prototyping forms of space um, and spatial relations. I mean, the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard said that the L-shaped uh, sofa was the death of conversation uh, because you know, no one could face each other on an L-shaped sofa. Um, you know, he, he pointed out that in the 19th century, uh, you would have two chairs just sitting opposite each other in front of a fireplace with no table in between them at all, right? Now we would find that such an incredibly confrontational uh, scenario, and I was thinking before when we had the panel out here, how it would be different if instead of four people facing the front, you know, you had two people on either side facing each other, and how those very minor changes in relationship uh, have huge consequences for uh, social and power uh, relations. Anyway, so these are kind of you know the things that I think are awesome, mostly to do with Mies actually. I mean, he, what I really admire about Mies a lot was. Uh, and it's not a kind of formal or aesthetic thing, but I, I, I really admire the fact that he spent the first 10 years of his career basically just doing exhibitions. And they were exhibitions in textile, in, in fabric, out of real architectural materials, I mean, ultimately culminate, culminating in the Barcelona Pavilion, which was a real building. Um, but in a way, he used this to rapidly experiment with different forms of space and different ways of relating. And, and that, you know, was very much in the back of my mind. And, of course, you know, the Wiesenhofsiedlung, where you actually then take those exhibition materials and forms and turn them into buildings that people can then live in, is part of the ultimate um, ambition of, of the real foundation. Uh, in order to understand the exhibition a little bit more, I'm just going to very rapidly run through four categories of ownership. These were developed by uh, monks in the medieval era uh, because Jesus says, give away everything you own immediately, don't keep anything, you can't have anything. So the monks were like, Oh, what could he mean by this? You know, I mean, what could really, how are we supposed to survive if we give away everything? But because they were very pious, they then decided to set out what ownership really meant. And the first category is, is use. Use is when the thing that you are trying to own is destroyed in the act of owning it. So a glass of water is a great example because in the act of owning the glass of water, it's exhausted. It no longer exists. Uh, usufruct, I mean, you'll know ancient lights, it's, it's the right to something. So it's like bridal paths, it's, it's the right to use something like um, you know, a park or a street or a public square. These are all, we have the right to access them, we don't own them individually. Possession, I think a Patek Philippe watch is the best example because they say that you never really own a Patek Philippe, you merely look after it for the next generation. And this kind of, you often hear this form of ownership being uh, put forward by aristocrats who say, you know, well, I don't, I'm not really, don't really own the estate, you know, I'm just caretaker for the next generation. Uh, and, and it's kind of temporal uh, ownership. And then you have dominion, which in its kind of strictest sense means the right to kill something. If I buy a Jeff Koons work and I install it in my house and I really own it, I also have the right to destroy it. Um, I, can, I, I can do that. And of course, dominion is intricately linked up with the history of the home because under Roman law, the, the, the domus, which, which had as its, as it he, as its head uh, a kind of father figure, 
uh, dominated and domesticated all the people who were within that house. I mean, domestication we tend to think of as being a process of uh, accustoming animals to live with us, but actually domestication is the process by which we condition other humans to live together. So, uh, you know, the, part of this was also to create a scaleless exhibition, and this is what I was saying about not making a clear distinction between whether you're producing a building or an exhibition or a publication or a pamphlet, and they should all work coherently to produce this same argument, which in this case is really trying to promote the idea that if the home is a site for constant experiment, uh, it must also, therefore, you know, as an individual, you can go home and experiment with the placement of furniture in your house, <coughs> change the way people relate to each other. Um, we were told by the British Council to produce uh, uh, you know, rendered images of what the pavilion would look like, which I profoundly resist for many reasons I won't go into, but instead we produced these artworks, uh, which were effectively kind of like slightly surreal very heavily airbrushed and manipulated images with captions. The idea was that you look at an image which is very banal, you know, it's, a, it's a woman's hand doing the washing up, then you read the caption, which is normally extremely ideologically inflammatory, without unpaid domestic labor the family ceases to exist. So about 53% of all the labor that takes place in the UK is unpaid, most of it done by women in the home. We literally do not have enough money in the British economy to pay people for all their un unpaid labor. We couldn't value that because it would, it would tank the economy. And I find that really interesting, that in a way the survival of capitalism relies on so much labor which exists outside of its kind of, you know, compulsion that we must value everything, put a, a value on everything. Anyway, so there, there's some of the kind of artworks. Um, what we also then asked, the, 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 the kind of structure of the team was rather an unusual one. We asked uh, the participants, who were majoritively architects, to design uh, models, uh, which is basically another word for typology. Um, so there were real buildings that we asked them to design, and then we took those buildings and effectively uh, translated their essence. We shrunk them down to the scale of maquettes, and then we blew the maquette up. So the pavilion itself ends up being a kind of model that you walk inside. And the purpose of that is that when you make a maquette, as you know, you can't include every detail. I mean, you can't have like running water in a 1 to 200 model. So you have to perform a kind of abstraction. And in that abstraction, you extract the essence of, of the architecture. This was the entrance to the pavilion. We put a huge Georgian front door, which is perhaps the only nod to, uh, you know, vernacular of any kind. Um, it's colossal mainly because I wanted to dominate this axis of the, of the pavilion. Um, but it's also really important because the, the door, I mean, mo most of the really important inventions in the door come from the British. They invented the idea of house numbers. So, for example, the Romans couldn't charge for uh, access to water because they didn't have street names or numbers. They didn't have a way of isolating the house as a productive unit. Once you invent street numbers, suddenly you can begin to calculate input and output and the metrics. The door is also traditionally the kind of moment at which privacy appears. It's the interface between society and the family. And I'm also really interested by what's called door furniture. I mean, these like the letterbox is also another English invention which I find really interesting. Um, you know, several centuries of complex social and infrastructural development around the national postal system. And in the end, what it really involves is putting a small rectangular hole in a door. I mean, I, I'm really interested by how those very small traces uh, precipitate out of very complex systems. Um, this was the first, uh, well, the second room, I'll come back to the first one later, a, a Home for Days, done by the Art Collective Air. Uh, this is kind of a point about representation, which I think comes back to something that Brian was saying. This is an artwork, so it's not the same as the architectural works, because this doesn't represent anything. It, it, it is what it is. Um, it doesn't point to something else, it, it is this. And in this case, the, the art collective were looking at you know, what it means to be at home for days, and they were saying, well, you can't really be at home for days in a physical location unless all homes were identical. If you're moving every couple of days, what you can do is, is take something with you. And they looked at the history of inflatable architecture, which, of course, in the 60s was seen as very kind of utopian. In the future, we'd all live in bubbles, kind of Francis Delagray had some beautiful, uh, with uh, Raina Banham, some very beautiful inflatable homes. Uh, of course, the consequence of that was not 
that at all. In fact, the inflatable went into two things. One was the kind of children's bouncy castle as a form of entertainment, and the other was the air mattress, which is, of course, why it's called Airbnb, um, air bed and breakfast. Uh, and so in this case, these were highly personalized um, zorbs, the kind of at the border of being an inhabitable architecture and a form of entertainment uh, that, the, that also kind of represented or manifested the digital bubble that we all live in. Their argument was that home is where the Wi-Fi is, that you take you know, your access to Spotify and Amazon wish list and these things at Facebook. That's the core of actual domesticity today. Second project, Home for Months, was a house without housework. The idea that uh, it looked at the history of the British boarding house, um, which today has a very bad rap, but actually the reason they were made illegal is because they were too successful rather than not successful enough. They were huge buildings where someone could arrive without a reservation and pay a flat fee on normally a weekly basis for access to a bed and board. Often it would include meals, it would include laundry, and they were so successful, they were low cost. They allowed people to move from the countryside into the cities very easily. The difficulty was that in the 1930s, when, when there was a recession and the, the, the depression, uh, there was a progressive push to try and make them illegal because they tended to be segregated by gender. And the difficulty with that was that um, it prevented household formation because people had no motivation to get married and move in together because it was so much more expensive. So in this case, the question was, well, if you're at home for months, you know, how, how can you create a space which is kind of in between a hotel and a... Uh, and a home. And, and in this case, the idea from Dogma and Black Square was to create, uh, you know, in the actual model itself, these are structural cores that exist in an open floor plate. And each space has a very private interior, which can be closed off, which has kind of bathroom, bedroom. And the space around it is common, this kind of negotiation. The idea that community, in a way, is also based on the idea of or, or the possibility of being alone. Uh, a home for years was super abstract. Not a lot of people really got it in the exhibition itself. It was designed by, uh, or comes from Julia King, who's a Venezuelan British architect. Um, she grew up and lives in, in India, mostly does kind of Apollo 13-like projects of, of uh, emergent infrastructural projects. So she'll go and work with one uh, one house and whatever it is that, ha you know, whatever plastic pipe sizes they have. She'll do an engineering project to install a, a toilet into their house and then as the neighbors begin to imitate this system, eventually you get in a kind of emergent infrastructure um, in uh, very kind of poor areas. Uh, and she combines that with kind of wetland filtration and so on. Anyway, in this case, she was looking at uh, how to create affordable housing for years because the main essence of people who own homes for years is that they engage in speculation. They buy it, they add an extra bedroom, they put a you know, new bathroom in and then they flip it. So she stripped everything out of the home and started reducing massively all the fixtures and finishings which, which took out a lot. And then we worked with Royal Bank of Scotland to effectively design a mortgage system based on the idea of the shell. So the mortgage that you take out is for the shell and all of the interior belongs to you. And this also has a, a great power of decommodifying the interior because if you want to have marble floors, you do that. If you want to have lino floors, you do that. It doesn't have any impact on the value of the home itself. Um, the toilet was particularly, uh, I mean, all the Germans laughed at this because you got kind of 20 meter perspective onto this toilet and they thought this was hilarious. Um, but, th but this was in fact the only thing that Royal Bank of Scotland said you must include, which is um, it, for sanitary reasons, otherwise everything else can be stripped out of the home. And um, we included a kind of mortgage terms and conditions in the show because at the abstract level, the, the mortgage is actually the architecture. I mean, what she had really designed was, was not a building, it was, it was a mortgage. Um, the final uh, of these rooms is uh, Decades, done by Hesselbrand, which I mentioned before. This is a uh, home without functions. So uh, they were very interested by the idea that you don't, have, um, uh, you don't have a kitchen or a bathroom or whatever. You have a dry and a wet, you have a light and a dark, you have a public and a private. Even at the level of the bed, they said, well, you know, in 50 or 60 years, you know, uh, 50 years ago, it was not uncommon to have a couple, a married couple, sleep in twin beds. Now that would seem extremely odd. Uh, in the future, we, we don't know, we don't want to make presuppositions about family structure, about relationships between people, so they designed a two by two meter square bed 
that accommodates a number of people. This, this was the, the first room that you enter into and in the room that I was uh, responsible for, uh, the hours room. And, uh, you know, the question is, uh, what does it mean to be at home at hours? Aren't we already at home for hours? And my, kind of, my interest was in saying, well, what if we could create another kind of space in the home which was between private dwellings that was a, a form of kind of common space, let's say, which we might occupy for several hours during the day, but which was neither part of our own home nor outside our own home. And for this, uh, I took the kind of model of the, the tower block um, and began to pull apart the core and corridor structure. I don't know if I've got an image of this. Hang on. Yeah. So this was the tower I designed. Basically, uh, instead of a kind of core and then the corridor and all the apartments that come off it, by beginning to pull that apart, you can create spaces in between. And on every floor, at least one of the spaces that are in there is, is communally shared. And the idea then is to say, well, <coughs> these are all effectively non-functional spaces. They have no predetermined uh, use. Uh, you can create these spaces in between. And in fact, the, the financial model that's used to generate this building at Canary Wharf was based on the idea uh, of giving uh, one of these apartments for um, 600 pounds or less per month rent. Um, and more than that, it was really the idea that uh, sharing might be a form of luxury, not a form of compromise, which sounds very banal, but in an English context can sometimes be tricky to argue for. Um, and, and therefore, you know, the space was very much about what happened, how, what are the incentives to share? What are the incentives for us to pool our resources together? There are some obvious ones, but in this case, they were kind of basically, I designed just two pieces of furniture. Um, the first was uh, a day bed. Um, in 2014, this, the, the bed overtook the sofa as the most used piece of furniture in uh, the British home for the first time. And the reason for this is that we're doing less social activities at home and we're doing a lot more in bed. We're eating in bed, we're watching, consuming media, we're talking to our friends, uh, we're working in bed, we're doing, I mean, 80% of us check our uh, social media or email accounts within five minutes of waking up and going to bed. A lot of teenagers are doing it during the night. Uh, you know, there's, there's kind of huge anxiety about this, and the question then was, well, why do you even need a sofa? I mean, what's the difference between a sofa and a bed? So in this case, it, I redesigned this as a kind of single piece of furniture. As an individual bed, it's a space for either work or rest, but when you bring two of them together, you establish a kind of social relationship between the two people, and when you bring three of them together, this shelf begins to become more like a Roman triclinium, where you, you know, the Romans used to eat on their, on their side in a U. Um, and the idea then is that, you know, if you have four or five, you might begin to have orgies or, you know, in a way this, uh, it's quite a, a dry aesthetic, I'm aware, but the, the idea is that you don't predicate uh, social relations in, in the, you don't build it into the furniture, you allow that to emerge, and particularly in this case, it's kind of gestalt, the more of these and the more people are encouraged to bring them together, the more possibilities within the space there are. And the other piece of furniture was this uh, what I call a garderobe. A, a garderobe is kind of archaic in English, but exists in most other European languages. It's different from a wardrobe because a garderobe, is, a wardrobe is where you put clothes. A garderobe is where you keep stuff safe. Before we had locks on the doors, we really needed garderobes to put our valuables in. And this, of course, is a transparent garderobe. It's engineered by Arup because they, they were rather they weren't crazy about the fact the whole thing's made out of five mil acrylic, but we did manage to, because you know, when you slide a door, the whole thing wobbles, but we engineered it to prevent that, which I was very, you know, kind of architectural aside, maybe. But anyway, the point is that in this case, it's, it's the common objects of a shared household. Um, there are two functions to this, both within the private home and within the shared home. Within the shared home, this uh, basically encourages people, if we think about occupation through time and use through time, of course we don't all need a vacuum cleaner, one between ten of us would do, uh, but if we're prepared to share a vacuum cleaner, I mean that seems to make sense, maybe we'll just do that. If we're prepared to, to do that with a vacuum cleaner, how far would we go? Would we do it with clothing? Would we do it with records? In, we've got in there power tools, board games, but also this uh, collection done by a British fashion designer called J.W. Anderson, which is a, a, a kind of collection of clothes which are gender and age neutral. The idea being that 
you wouldn't just share a ball gown or a tuxedo with your neighbor. You might share your t-shirts and your socks and, you know, how far are we prepared to share? And to what extent can we imagine the sharing economy is not a form of extracting latent value from existing things, but really as a kind of uh, a cooperative ownership. Um, and then, of course, within the private home, uh, this these furniture, so you can see there, you know, no, no real functions to these spaces. You just divide the the space with these two pieces of furniture. Uh, the idea is that you incorporate all of your kind of mechanisms for life, but, but more than this, I mean, the idea is also to say, uh, when you do that, when you, tr when you put your objects, your personal objects within the vitrine, you transform their significance. So there's no longer any hierarchy between these objects. Your grandmother's ashes, and you can't quite see it in this because it's been clipped, unfortunately, but there's a transparent uh, refrigerator so, you know, last night's Chinese and your grandmother's ashes, your collection of fine books and your washing up liquid, they all become equally uh, presented with a view also to, to challenging whether or not we really need to own that stuff. I mean, I think one of the reasons so many domestic objects are so ugly is because we never really look at them. We put them away and there's this obsession with constant kind of storage within the house. We buy things in order to store them so that we can buy other things and then hide them as well. It's like sometimes I feel I go into people's apartments, it's like the whole house is storage. It's like, what, what is this for exactly? Whereas in this case, the idea is that if you're constantly I find objects very stressful. If you're constantly presented with objects, uh, it might make you think twice about the acquisition of more. And I think, um, and that's it. Thank you very much.